Hi there, my name is Victoria Bowler, and today we are talking about some options for structuring the music lesson. In a typical music class, we might see students between 25 and 45-ish minutes. So within that time frame, what is the most impactful way to organize our time? Ideally, we would be dividing class up so that students have the highest amount of fun and engagement and then the highest amount of musicking as possible. That's what we'll talk about today. Conversations around how to organize daily lessons are curricular conversations. And in the podcast that goes along with this video, we talk about some different frameworks for organizing curriculum. So if that is something that is interesting to you, you can use the link in the description to take a listen. All right, with that said, let's jump in. Let's start with the first lens. What are we going to do? One very popular option is to organize the lesson plan around activities. For this, the breakdown of the lesson might look like a welcome song and then an instrumental activity and then a movement activity and maybe a notational literacy activity and then a closing song. This lesson plan is based around the doings of music or the musical skills. There are some really positive things about this lesson structure that I think are worth highlighting, namely the different modes of musicking that are happening here. This lesson is set up to be incredibly active and to keep students engaged the whole lesson. So notice that we're not staying on one skill throughout the whole lesson. We're jumping around, we're moving around to different ways to experience and understand music. And you might recall that within the lens of multiple means of engagement, this is a really beautiful way to structure the lesson. The diversity of the experiences is really the gem of this lesson structure, in my opinion. There are some potential challenges with this approach though. If we exclusively organize lessons around activities, like a welcome song and an instrumental activity, that kind of thing, it can become tricky to see the thread that ties those activities together from week to week. So here's the problem. Let's imagine that you are searching Pinterest for a fun activity for third grade and you find one and you use it in class and your students love it. Well, that's great. That's a win, right? But the problem here potentially is that when the fun activity is over, what are you going to do in the next lesson? If I teach you how to play a song on barred instruments, and that's it, that's the entire lesson segment, then the next class, I need to find a new song to teach you. You see, we're constantly starting over on this hamster wheel. We're starting over from scratch each lesson. And then what happens if I am teaching a mallet part, but someone doesn't understand what they are supposed to be doing. They don't understand the specific part that they are playing. What are we doing to help students build knowledge and skills that they can reference when they come against a new challenge? Where are the instrumental skills that we could build off of in this example? So this is a lesson structure based on how we experience musical understandings. What we're not explicitly addressing here is the common thread of the understanding itself from lesson to lesson. So let's think about a way we might take this active approach for this lesson structure and tweak it with a slightly different framework. So here's another example, and this time it's based around what we will learn instead of what we will do. We're going to start off with a welcome song and then move to a main musical focus, and then we'll have a game or a change of pace, and then a secondary musical focus, and then a closing song. And I should reference here that this framework is not something that I invented. This is an established way to organize the lesson. And I read about it first in Susan Brumfield's work, but you can find it in other places in music pedagogy conversations. Okay, so let's just take that first musical focus. Let's imagine that the musical concept we're working on, because remember, this is a concept-based approach. Let's imagine that the concept is pitch, and then the specific tonal pattern is la in so, la, so, mi. In the first class, we might spend like seven minutes with the song Apple Tree in that main concentration section. So let's say that students are going to sing the song and play the game. It is likely that we will spend a fair amount of time on this part because we're probably teaching the song and the game since this is the first musical lesson with this concept focus. And then after we've played the game for several rounds, we'll do a challenge. Students are going to stand in place and interhear the song while they trace the melodic contour of the first eight beats. That's it. That's the whole first day, seven minutes. In the next class, we might move Apple Tree down to the change of pace section and then spend about three minutes on it tops. So for this, we'll sing the song and play the game like we did in the first class. And then after a few rounds, we can challenge students and ask them to inner hear the song while we play the game. 
Uh, if you're not familiar, inner hearing is where it's like you turn the radio on in your head, but you're not making any sound. So for this, students would have to be all singing the song at the same time as they play the game together. And then in that lesson, the main concentration portion of the lesson would be another So La So Me song, uh, like We Are Dancing in the Forest. In the third lesson, we can move Apple Tree back to this main concentration section of the lesson. And we'll start by singing and playing the game like we've been doing, but we're probably only going to do it once because there's a lot of other stuff to get to in this particular lesson segment. So we sing and play the game, and then let's say that we have students turn to a partner and together find a way to arrange this uh, la, so, la, so, me section on body percussion or with movement. So that could be, will your apples fall on me? Or, will your apples fall on me? Lots and lots of options here. And then from there, we might point out the different contour of the melody on the board and trace it while we sing. So we are singing, so higher pitch, so me. From there, we can orally identify that this higher pitch is a step above so. And by the way, if we were to use a barred instrument for this step, that would make a really nice visual. That's a conversation for another time, but that can be a nice scaffold for this step and skip work here. Okay, so we can visually identify a step higher than so. By the fourth class, we might want to break away from apple tree. <laughs> so the main concentration part of the lesson, we can sing the song and play the game to, let's say, Plansies Clapsies. And after a few rounds, we'll probably discover that this new high pitch from Apple Tree is in Plansies Clapsies too. And then from there, instead of us showing students the melody contour on the board, students can show it to us. They can map it out themselves line by line, and they might even discover that this same is the same core melody that happens the entire song. throughout the entire thing. And then with a partner, students can figure out how to play this song on barred instruments by ear. If it's in line with your pedagogical goals, this might be the time that you change the vocabulary from high, this new high pitch, to law and show how you write it down in class. Let's say that we bring Apple Tree back in the next class and figure out how to play it by ear on barred instruments. And then with a partner, students can rearrange those pitches to create their own version of the song, a new melody to Apple Tree. And then students can use bingo chips or other manipulatives to write down the contour of their new melody using so, me, and this higher pitch, la. That might sound like a lot, and it is. In these examples, students are singing, they're playing barred instruments, they're moving, they're reading, they're writing, they are arranging, they are orally identifying, they're inner hearing, and they are playing a game. We also have a lot of collaboration with other classmates, and we have creative choices by arranging things for body percussion and rewriting the melody. When we look at these lessons, there are even more activities here than the activities-based lesson structure. But you see, we've zoomed out and we are looking at musical skill development over time, not just a single class. You'll also see that these skills are not isolated on their own in a specific part of the lesson, right? So like there was not a specific uh, lesson segment for arranging. We were just naturally embedding arranging in the learning process. In this case, the pitch concept and that specific tonal pattern, so, la, so, mi, because there's a connection between these lessons over time, students can figure out a song by ear on barred instruments and they can arrange things and they can write down their arrangement because they've been thinking musically about this one specific pitch pattern for lots of different lessons. One way to think about this that I find really helpful is, um, you know those bubble mind maps? <laughs> if we were to take a map like that and put the musical concept in the center, then all of the ways we can show that concept would go around that one specific pitch understanding. So we are, you know, singing and playing and moving and reading and orally identifying and all of these things. These are all of the experiences that bring diversity to the lesson over time. But notice they're all pointing back to the same purpose of the lesson segment. In this case, la and so la so me. The benefit of this is that when it's time to expand our tone set to include other pitches, students have the oral skills to articulate what they notice about the new pitch. So is it higher or lower than what they already know? 
uh, how much higher, how much lower? And then does the new pitch happen in other songs we sing in class or songs that we sing outside of class? When we know how far away it is from other pitches in our conscious vocabulary, we can figure out songs by ear on barred instruments or on recorder or on piano or whatever instrument students are using. And that's the beauty of this concept-based approach. In concept-based teaching, we are allowing for the transfer of knowledge between lots of different classes. And that can happen in school settings and outside school in the real world. So you can probably see that this way of planning is really closely tied to long range curriculum plans. And this doesn't mean that we can't search Pinterest for a fun third grade activity. And it doesn't mean that you need to create your own curriculum and every activity from scratch. It just means that we will probably change the way we search for activities on Pinterest. And we might ask some clarifying questions. So when we find a fun activity, we might ask, what am I using this song or game or activity or piece to teach? Where does this activity lead? What is the natural next step? And what do students need to know and be able to do before they can do this activity? The medium and the skills, all of the doings of the music lesson, so like the singing and speaking and playing and moving and reading and writing, all of that stuff, those are there to actualize the understanding of a musical concept. Today we've talked about a lot of things, but the main idea is that when we structure a music lesson, a very practical thing to do is to think about what concepts our activities are serving. And then a great way to think about that is to find some clarity, find some separation between musical skills and musical concepts. This takes us out of the lesson planning hamster wheel. What am I going to do next? And it puts us into a logical sequence that leads to musical understanding. It's a shift in thinking from how to do the activity to how to actualize a concept. When we look at one single lesson, we see lots of diversity in the musical skills that students are embodying. But then when we look horizontally from lesson to lesson and then year to year, we see this stream of musical concepts that are connected and they build on each other over time. So like I said, there is a podcast episode that goes along with this video that has a little bit more detail about some of these components of structuring the music lesson. So I will link that below and you can check it out if that is of interest to you. All right. Thank you so much for watching and happy teaching.